Assalamu alaikum. Hello. How is everyone today? And um, today we are talking about uh, creativity and innovation, the thinking process. And welcome to the program, Mubashir. How are you? Hi. Yeah, I'm well, thank you. How are you doing? Good. Good, good. No, it's... Um, so I was thinking about uh, this this program um, and I was looking into some examples and looking at some of the things that are happening. And I read a story about Richard Branson. You know Richard Branson? Yeah, he's a, quite an iconic British entrepreneur. British entrepreneur. Yeah, you're from uh, from that region. So maybe you have more following, but he's a global, um, global, he has a global following. And the, so I want to start the conversation today with this, uh, with Richard Branson and, and the airline that he created called Virgin Atlantic, and I, now they have other, the Virgin airline. Do you, you know how he started that airline? Hmm. I think a good story is coming. So go ahead, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so Richard Branson um, was, was going to Virgin Islands, okay? And um, he had a plan to meet with his girlfriend and spend some time with her. Um, so he booked a flight and, and everything. And there's so many people who are going to Virgin I, uh, Island. And then a bummer, uh, that flight got canceled. And what he did in that situation was quite amazing and was, was quite interesting. And something that started me thinking about creativity and innovation. So there are two types of people, people who see a problem as a problem and people who see a problem as an opportunity. So Richard Branson saw this problem as an opportunity. So what he did was he booked, he chartered a flight. So, and then all the people who were going to Virgin Island on the canceled flight he put those people on this charter flight and then he took these people to Virgin Island. He spent some time over there and then obviously he come back. But when he came back, he uh, called Boeing and um, he talked to them. He said, oh, do you have any used um, airplanes that I can uh, lease? And um, Boeing said, yeah, why not? Um, we have some airplanes. We have some um, uh, airplanes that are sitting on the side. You can have them. So he took one and he started the, uh, this Virgin Airline or Virgin Atlantic. Um, and this is how the, the, the this, this is the story of how this, this whole thing began. And, and this is just very interesting for me um, about the way of thinking and the type of action he took through this. Do, do you come across these issues or do you, do you think about these things sometimes, Bobesh? Well, that's, I suppose, the key difference between an entrepreneur versus an innovator versus just a daydreamer. So I assume many of us would have had a situation where the flight was canceled or the bus was canceled uh, where we needed to go. And most people tend to grumble about it <laughs> and say, oh, why can't they fix it or have more capacity, more buses, more planes, more whatever. And few people start thinking, they put their solve the problem hat on and they start thinking, okay, so what do we do given the current situation? Richard Branson example, for example, here is an interesting, very, very uh, useful illustrative example. Hire another plane, 
there are people, there is demand, why not capture that demand and immediately, if you have customers um, ready to pay you for something, it solves their problem and then it solves his problem as well. I suppose uh, the motivation to do something also might have played something uh, of a role in there had it not been wanting to go and meet his girlfriend instead of somebody is going to meet the in-laws or maybe it's just a boring business meeting maybe <laughs> he wouldn't right. do that much of an effort so who knows how much part the motivation has to play in it but i think the main thing is that uh, people see a problem then they have the choice in every instance in every moment there's a choice presented to us what do we do about it do we I don't know, become emotional and just say, oh, the life is unfair. There's a problem. There is a, each time there is a transition, each time there is a change, there is a, there is something that's happening. There are within, within those waves opportunities to ride the wave and, and surf it as well. Uh, so that's where I think this story is very illustrative that he took the action to do something about it. And then he went about it in a systematic manner and solved the problem for himself and then created a, a long-term profitable business from it as well. Right, and benefit the people also because people as well, yes. uh, benefited from this. Airbnb is another example, maybe another another time I'll oh, tell I you about. Now is the good time, let's do that. <laughs> you want to, so, I want to come and, and I don't have anywhere to sleep and there is a convention. Goodness me, what do I do? So go on, tell me. How can no, so I Airbnb is, is a very similar story. You know, so there are two guys in San Francisco with some big dreams and um, they're not able to pay their rent, uh, the apartment rent. And, and if, if you know San Francisco, it is one of the most expensive places to live in the US, but maybe globally one of the most expensive places to to live uh, so they they wanted to find a solution to this uh, this problem financial issues that they have so they found um, they, they found uh, they did some experiments one of the experiment was they they bought a uh, the uh, air mattress, and that's here. That's why air in the Airbnb. And um, they offered bread and uh, bread and breakfast, BNB, bread and breakfast, um, bed and breakfast, air, bed and breakfast um, to the people. And they they put an ad in in Craigslist, um, and then people start to show up. And this is how this, this whole thing started. And, and from this, they got some uh, inspiration. Yeah, okay, this can be an idea which is has a market which we can expand. And, and now you see Airbnb is, um, has market cap um, more than some of the, the biggest hotel chains. And the hotels are, are thinking about going to this model. Somebody have, some of them have gone to this model already, but this is the power of cre creativity. How do you see things? How do you solve problems? Yeah, and I remember from their story that they were selling cereal boxes at one point and supporting the, the fledgling business in all sorts of ways. Uh, and interesting that you say that the hotels are trying to adopt some of these strategies as well. I think remem I remember reading somewhere that why Amazon's model is so difficult for the conventional bookstores or retail shops to adopt. Um, and it might have some truth for the hotel industry as well is because you are either digital and therefore you are fully optimized for digital processing, logistics, operations, marketing, and uh, data management, you know, analysis of data and learning from it or you are conventional. But when you try to come here while maintaining your brick and mortar, the atoms and molecules structure as well, you are straddling. You are in the middle part, not fully digital, not fully brick and mortar. And that strategy is really difficult one to execute successfully. So it would be interesting to see how 
how these organizations go forward with it. Right. No. So, um, so, but is this something um, that people are born creative? They're born genius. I think it helps to have um, somewhat of a, you know, there there may be something in there. I don't know. The reason for that is because not everybody, everyone has access to more or less a lot of information and. Uh, still, we find that people have natural tendencies. There may be something to it, and I don't know the data about it. I definitely think that creativity and creative thinking is a process. It's like a muscle. And therefore, while not everyone can run like Usain Bolt or uh, Michael Johnson or, or somebody else like a very, very um, fast athlete, we all can jog a little bit. We all can improve our running by doing more of it. So just like any muscle, if we exercise it, if we practice it, we can definitely improve it. Hmm. Okay. And um, so let's, okay, let, let me, um, we start to talk and talk and talk. But let's maybe share a couple of things from our program today. Um, okay, so so that's our Richard Branson <clears throat> and um, the Virgin uh, Airline. So creative thinking process. Walk us through this. Uh, let's walk through this process here. Um, so there's a um, Mubashir, this connecting the dot exercise, I always find this interesting. Help me go through this exercise. And, and, and I know you've been doing this exercise for quite some time. Let's do this together so that, and then we talk about how, how people who are thinking different are solving this problem in so many different ways. Yes, of course. So Basically, it's a, it's a really simple exercise. And, and the beauty of this exercise lies in its simplicity. I usually, when I'm doing it with uh, groups of people in, in creative thinking workshops, I start by presenting this sort of uh, three by three matrix, nine dots. And the initial challenge is in a way really simple. Connect these dots with five lines. Connect so these. these yeah, all these. So let me let me, let me take. Um... You you should draw it because it's really fun, as well. And by practically doing it, you are going to find this really really um, interesting and illustrative as well. Nine dots, connect them with five lines. Here's my piece of paper. Um, so you're saying that. Um, I have to connect with how many lines, Boashir? With five lines. With five lines. That's easy. So most people are able to do that. You know, you connect all these dots without picking up your pen from the paper. This one, this, this, this. Yeah, is one, this two, three, four, five. Oh. yeah, basically in any which way you can go square around it and then in the middle a diagonal line, etc. Yeah, so this, 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 this. Five so lines. four lines. Is that no, is that no, what five. you're what you are doing five. is with five lines. There are five lines. Oh. One, two, no, I, one, I did it four lines. Three, four, five. Okay. But that's excellent because the next challenge is, is doing it in four lines, which you have already done but quite often people struggle with it. So I give them the challenge number two. Okay, you have done it with five lines. Now can you do it with four lines? Doing it with four lines require a little bit of a different thinking because what you see is people are struggling, they are making lines and they have to be straight lines, can't curve them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we start to think about the concept of thinking outside the box and, and busting some of our uh, implicit assumptions. Um, so basically the, the solution to this is typically easy. If you go to the next slide, you can see it in action as well. 
doing it in four lines requires thinking a little bit in terms of how you are going to um, connect without having to impose any boundaries. So if you go to the next slide, doing it with four straight lines means that you can extend beyond the boundary of the dots and doing it that way, mm. an arrow or a kite. But these are four lines and nobody ever said that you can't extend your line beyond the boundary or the limit of the three by three square. So here is a right. kind of implicit assumption that's being challenged or broken that you know we can actually do it in, in that way. Uh, but that's where it becomes more interesting because, okay, so you have managed to do it with four lines. Can you do it with three straight lines? So that requires further breaking of some assumptions, thinking more in terms of, okay, challenge has changed. How do we do it with three lines? Hmm. Three lines. Yeah. Interesting. So I, I mean, mm -hmm. go ahead. Let me let me try to do this with three lines here. Um, bring my pen. Usually I set a time limit as well. I think to them that okay, I Okay, like so if I do one, two, three, three, very good. But you have missed two lines. I there. missed two. <laughs> two dots yeah. there. Uh, maybe. But you're on the right lines, you are thinking sort of on the right lines here. So if you go to the next slide, you can see how it's done. Essentially, it's the same concept, but this time it's thinking in terms of, do we have to- Let me see if I can do like this. Yeah. You said go outside of the boundaries. Yeah, but we'll go a little bit more outside of the boundaries and bust another myth or assumption. You don't have to connect these dots from their dead center. If you were mm. to connect them just by touching them, Therefore, your lines could be a little bit slanted. Would that work? Mm. Okay. So as you do that, I will point out that purpose of all these exercises essentially in a way to try think a little bit differently and then progressively jump away from the assumptions that we are holding. So if you are not supposed to or not restricted to connect the lines through their centers, uh, to, to, through the centers of these dots, how could you do it? So if you want to go to the next slide, we just made it simpler as an animation, but it allows people to think now from five to four, now from four to three, can you do these, this, this exercise with three lines? Okay, I, my mouse is gone for some reason. Right. Okay. Yeah. So three lines, one, two, three, but this time it's um, touching some of the dots on the periphery. So once we do this, it becomes more interesting. Can we do it with one line? And mm. the key thing is not the activity of one line, but the key thing is that the mental process, the creative process, what can we do what assumptions that we are holding, implicit assumptions that are not necessarily a restriction or, or constraint of the system? What assumption can we bust? What assumption can we break that would allow us to do it with a single line? So just a hint, I mean, if you go to the next slide, you can see it uh, in action as well. But basically, why does it have to be a line of this thickness? What if you could have a very, very thick line? Or what if you wow. could have okay. dot, dots in a very, very small size? What if these dots were microscopic? In that case, your pen or pencil would just connect them 
if you were uh, to do it. Or if your line was thick from a brush, like a marker or a brush, yeah. you can have a line and that can connect it, right? So it's a progressive, you can see that we are exercising the muscle again and again. And with each progressive um, exercise, we are finding that, oh, okay, so we can do it this way. What if we can do it that way? So let me put it <laughs> to one more challenge. Can you connect these dots through a, not a line, which we have done here, not a single line, but through a single dot, connect them all with a dot. Mm. And the key challenge here, as we go through this animation here as well, is what if the material on which these dots are appearing was not a solid uh, material, like uh, it's not a glass or anything, it's a paper right. that can be folded. So if you fold all of these uh, layers into one single layer, then you can actually stab it <laughs> to have a single point. But key point is, these exercises as part of the creative thinking process help us think through and slowly try to expand um, and, and question. So train our brain in a way that we can gently start to question the assumptions that are holding us back from achieving something more creative, something more breakthrough. What, what, what are these some of these assumptions? Let's talk about them. Like in this example, um, what I, I see the first one I saw was, you talked about the size and positioning of, of this, uh, of the exercise. So I was thinking about the line need to be straight and it has to be in a certain way, but then you talked about maybe looking at the problem in a different way. Yes. The only constraint was that the line needs to be straight, but the uh, positioning, it could extend outside the boundaries of the uh, mm. three by three dots. The size of the dots or the size of the instrument with which it's being uh, done. So that's like point number one or point number three. Drawing instrument could be uh, bigger or wider or what have you. Similarly, material, I mean, is it a permanent material or can we change the materials uh, shape and form um, and then there are kind of more interesting dynamics of it when we are addressing or looking at any problem we start to look at it from different angles from different uh, structures and constructs and that's something that's coming further down in the presentation with the six thinking hats methodology as well but essentially is there a uh, some leeway in how the success criteria is going to be evaluated. What is the uh, challenge asking us to do? And where can we take some liberties? Can we uh, do it in a different way? So what are the, 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 the different aspects of it that we are holding in our mind as assumptions are very, very useful constructs because they allow us our human brains to process information at lightning fast speed. And, you, and, and it has been essential for the human race's survival as well. Um, if you hear the rustling in the jungle, in the, like, you know, in our ancestors' time, you don't have time to analyze whether this rustling is wind or is it just a rabbit or is it a tiger waiting for you? So you can assume that there is something big and bad there, and then you can take appropriate action, et cetera. But when it comes to creative thinking and innovation process, assumptions then are the sort of opposite of that survival thing that helped us. Assumptions hold us back because then we are restricted within some constructs and some concepts that we are not busting through. Mm. Now, in, in the current environment, if we look at the, the current environment, what, what, are, what are some of the things that you're seeing and uh, what are some of the things that, um, that people are, what assumptions are being busted in the current environment? What, if we take a look at this example, um, like, 
one of the things that I, I'm thinking is this working virtually was a big myth that was busted. Mm -hmm. It was a fixed thinking, like we cannot work outside of maybe the physical building. Yeah, that, that's very interesting because I think the one of the maybe cornerstones of it was that I need to be able to see you eye to eye, you know, in face-to-face uh, -face meeting and see your body language. People used to think that in order to know what is actually being said or being done or like, you know, what and how you are behaving. But first of all, the cameras and these things are becoming better and better. So you can actually get quite a lot more information now in the virtual environment as well. The nature of the jobs is changing. Um, the information now comes with the, the, the assignments or tasks come with a lot of ancillary data that is gathered from other things, the, the digital systems, the sensors and what have you. Uh, and also maybe the structures and the laws and the rules in society have evolved to a stage where the it's no longer a one person's critical requirement that that person must assess whether the opponent is telling the truth or not. There are safety nets that are built into society as well. Um, so I think basically it is now very much possible to do quite effectively a lot of these things, um, you know, what tasks to be done in society remotely. Not everything by its very nature require a face-to-face -face, um, uh, meeting or consultation. The communication that face-to-face uh, meeting allows the information exchange that the face-to-face -face meeting allows can very effectively be done with these digital solutions nowadays. Mm. What what other assumptions do you see are being broken? I, I love this part because I mean um, there are so many interesting examples. You have to have a fleet of taxis in order to run a fantastic taxi company. Mm, no you don't. You can have an app and then you can have taxi on demand and let people who own their cars come and provide the taxi service. All you are enabling is an interface that allows transportation from one place to the other. That has been enabled because of the confluence of technologies like mobiles and GPS and the network connectivity, hence Uber, hence Lyft, hence Kareem, hence the rise of the uh, ride share or, or call the taxi on demand kind of uh, services. Uh, in US, um, I was amazed to see the zip car concept. I mean, that was a precursor to Uber and Lyft kind of concept where there are a few cars available and you can just go and at the time of need, you can just book it and then the code would open the car's door and you can use it. You have to have hotel chain in order to provide uh, accommodation service. So the references to Airbnb, which we were using uh, slightly earlier with regards to, you know, uh, if you are controlling the interface for access to these resources, then you don't need to have these resources in place. I mean, I'm holding this iPhone here and people have uh, Android phones and what have you. And there was a concept that you must have a keyboard for your phone. Uh, how else are you going to input the, the numbers and the text message and what have you? And then Jobs busted the, the myth or the assumption that no, we don't need the keyboard physically present on it. You can have a virtual keyboard present itself as and when the need arises. Mm. So there are, each time you have a fantastic, um, like this is, this is a good creativity process technique. Think of what is a long held belief, a, a, a de facto standard assumption, and then invert it on its head. So for example, for to have a really good washing powder, it must have ability to cleanse your clothes, right? But imagine if uh, that assumption was inverted on its head that the washing powder or the washing material doesn't actually clean your clothing. It just freshens them up. Hence Lenore and some of the other Procter & Gamble offerings, et cetera, where people don't want their delicate clothing to be cleaned every th time with the industrial strength cleaning agents. They just want them to be freshened up a little bit without the cleaning part there. And a new market is born, a whole new sector is born. So th this, uh, what is very interesting for me is the whole idea of business reinvention. 
And, and creativity plays a key part in this business reinvention. Uh, the more the people are thinking in a different outside of the box, they can recreate the businesses because the constraints that we have because of the situation we are in right now, they are very heavy constraints. Um, but when we have constraints, do we become more creative or, or do these constraints overwhelm us what, what are your thoughts about this? How constraints are playing a part in creativity and innovation in this age right now? I think some constraints are good. If you have no constraints whatsoever, if you have a full carte blanche, totally blank sheet, then many times people can, especially professionals, because they have so much knowledge, people can get into an analysis paralysis problem. Uh, getting to the starting point or the creator's block kind of issue. Uh, the role of constraints is well researched and some constraints play a really, really good um, and helpful role. Not overly excessive constraints, but some constraints are good. Um, and I think the uh, key element there is the ability to think. Now we talked about thinking outside the box, right? And that's a potential construct or concept that's also it in itself is a bit of a constraint why not think outside of a sphere or a ball or why not think inside of the box or why 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 are we talking about thinking outside or inside the box why don't we change the box and and improve the box itself i mean they are just words and semantics but they represent a way of us sharing ideas and then trying to create new shared understanding as well. Um, in the creative thinking and, and innovation create program, later on there is a full section on, first of all, thinking outside the box, but then techniques like systematic inventive thinking, SIT and others, where you think inside the box. And that's actually where truly astounding, truly interesting breakthrough innovations happen as well, when you start thinking inside the box. Mm. Now, in the, the creative thinking process, Mubashir, you were uh, talking about De Bono, six thinking hats. So, um, so what, what are these thinking hats mean? Um, like the process thinking, um, the thinking hat for the facts and the thinking hat for benefits. Let me, let me share that, uh, that part um, here real quick. And maybe you can expand on this. What, what is this, these six thinking hats and how does this help in the creative thinking process? Right, so back in 70s and 80s, Edward de Bono was um, doing quite a lot of work in the uh, creativity and thinking processes. Um, and as he puts it in his book, which is really interesting read as well, and I will highly recommend it. Um, imagine that you are standing in front of a building, right? Uh, and part of your team is standing right in front, other part is standing, some people are standing in the back of the building, some are standing on the right hand side of the building, some on the left hand side. And everybody is shouting out what they see as the side of the building looking like that's going to result in a lot of cross communication and sort of not having a full understanding of what the building is like and what they are talking about. So now imagine if everybody gets together, first they go to the front of the building, they look at the building at the front of it fully comprehensively thoroughly. Then they all go to the side, right hand side of the building. They all look, all the team looks at the building again. Then everybody goes to the back of the building and then to the other side and then back to the front. Basically, by doing it that way, you are actually, all of the people are at all the time going together and, and having a perspective on it where there is still a capacity to absorb the dissent and difference of opinion. But people are looking at it through a process that allows them to move forward um, and, and get uh, to a new point in the thinking process rather than 
fighting and trying to prove each other wrong, um, fighting and arguing uh, about their points uh, validity. So this three, six thinking hat process is essentially a framework for thinking. It is a thinking in parallel or parallel thinking process. Parallel thinking process means that um, we are going to have a look at the problem or issue or challenge together, but one specific uh, aspect or one specific uh, perspective at a time from one specific dimension at a time. Uh, and it doesn't have to be in any particular order, but there are different uh, dimensions that De Bono suggested, which are very useful. So for example, let's talk about the white hat. White hat thinking is all about facts. It's neutral, it's objective, it's all about information and data. What is the information that's out there that can be verified? And at this stage, uh, people can just talk about the information itself without having it muddied up with, oh no, this cannot be done and there are problems or I want this this way, emotions or something. Basically just put facts on the table um, at the moment. Then people can think about, okay, how do we feel about it? So everybody can think about the intuition and hunches and, and the, so red is like, you know, danger sometimes, but basically it's the emotion and the passion and the heat of it. Okay, what are the feelings about this? You can come to benefits part, which is the uh, yellow thinking, which is uh, optimism and growth and, and positivity. Uh, why this idea can be useful? What are the things that are uh, useful in the whole uh, concept of the idea? You can think in terms of the green hat. Green is growth and fertility and creativity. Uh, what are the ideas and, and the alternatives and possibilities and, and the, the what can be like, you know, what is, is current and here now, right, uh, uh, right now, but what is the projected or future state? What can be, uh, what it might become kind of thinking. Um, and then you can have the black hat thinking, which is very important, which is all about uh, being cautious and being very careful looking at the counter arguments about why things might not work, what could be the difficulties, weaknesses, dangers, et cetera, what are the risks inherent in this whole proposition, et cetera. Uh, and the blue hat thinking is more about control. Think of sky, which overarches and, and covers everything. So blue hat thinking is more about um, organizing the thinking and it's a permanent role. So you usually assign the role of uh, blue hat thinking to somebody in the team that keeps track of are we following the the uh, parallel thinking process properly everybody is doing green hat at the moment or white hat or etc uh, keeping to uh, administrative tasks of keeping to time and what have you and the thing is having these structures in place in an organizational context for the meetings allows people to share and discuss things without being defensive, without being aggressive, without being uh, argumentative. Uh, a person can say, right, Mr. John, you have provided fantastic um, suggestions. The green hat thinking was fantastic. Let's all now wear uh, and, and employ a little bit of white hat thinking to find out what information about these ideas is available. Uh, and once the information has been discussed, somebody can say, right, great. You know, we have some great ideas, we have information, but let's all hear by wear the black hat for a little while. Let's discuss the potential risks of this whole thing. What could go wrong? Why it shouldn't be done? What are the, the dangers? And once those dangers or risks are discussed, people can then wear green hat again and say, okay, those issues that have been identified, are there any ways to address them and wear the yellow hat afterwards to see how uh, the benefits would over, uh, overcome or outweigh the dangers part of it. And then people can wear the red hat about how it would make them feel and how their customers would feel and, and what are their gut instincts telling them that is not captured in the, uh, for example, the white hat facts and figures part of it. So it's iterative, it's not a very rigid mechanism and certainly doesn't require 
buying hats and wearing those hats. It's just a framework that allows parallel thinking and creating more efficient, more uh, effective, <coughs> excuse me, more efficient, more effective, more constructive, more positive um, outcomes from creative thinking uh, engagements. So if we look at maybe um, um, an issue at this time, maybe if we, if we are in a setting, for example, you, you are an entrepreneur, you solve many problems and you are creating many, many different products. Uh, how, do you, how are you utilizing these six hats in your thinking process or the products that you're developing? Walk, walk me through one, one of your examples. Okay. Uh, first of all, generically speaking, I in 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 sort of our board meetings or team meetings, um, I'm careful to try and give air time uh, to any specific way of uh, discussion uh, without contaminating it with others. Because I mean, if you think about it, in our Western um, societies, uh, mainly the Socrates and Aristotle-based, argument-based learning is that you must present pros and cons of an idea, right? You must present and look at some problem from both positive, negative um, perspectives. And what tends to happen is that we feel duty-bound to mention the pluses, but as well as, and at the same time, often, the minuses of it. And the issue there is that if you are doing them immediately with one another, simultaneously nearly, then progress cannot be made. It's like having the car, and we used this example earlier in some place as well. If you are pressing the accelerator and the brake at the same time, then a lot of energy is being wasted without achieving movement. You have There is a place for the accelerator, there is a place for the brake, metaphorically speaking. Um, so some time ago, we had this interesting hypothetical discussion that because of uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, and since this is topical, I will use that as an example, two industries are getting really hammered. The hotels and the tourism industry, but the hotels mainly, and the dental industry, because you know patients are not going to dentists anymore, and they, especially for their routine checkups. Uh, very few are going if even the dentists are allowed to be open uh, for their urgent care. What if we combine them together? Because the problem is that in the dental practice, they have just one or maybe two rooms where the clinician is working. And the protocol is that once you have done the treatment for a patient, you have to wait for one and a half hours for the air to settle down and wipe everything out and then new patient can come in where do we have a place where there are lots and lots of rooms, different floors with professional room cleaning crew that takes pride in their work. So if, if on a trolley you have all the instruments and then you have patients in, in let's say 20 rooms in one floor of a hotel and the dental team just goes from room to room, treats the patients using the lift, goes up to the next floor starts treating patients there, and these patients from the first floor go back and their rooms are cleaned by the professional cleaning crew, you can maybe help and save two industries um, at the same time. Now, this is the kind of, if you think about it in terms of multi-hat thinking, this is the green hat thinking. This is the yellow hat thinking about the optimism, about the creativity, about the ideas. But then you start to think about the red hat thinking. How would people think about it or feel about it? How would they feel about going to a hotel and trying to do it? How would the authorities think about it? So there are some white hat thinking aspects into it that what are the facts and figures of, can this be done? Are there rules and regulations that would stop you from doing it? And some black hat thinking with regards to, are there actual risks? Because if something goes wrong with a the patient, then you don't have access to a whole lot of other stuff that in a hospital or dental practice you have, then what are you going to do with the emergencies? Uh, what are actual uh, issues, contingencies, what are the risks that uh, 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 
an operation like this a doctor or a patient might face, in which case those need to be addressed. But doing it in a systematic manner in this hypothetical scenario allows a team to evaluate an idea from different perspectives in a parallel thinking process. Mm. Very interesting. You know, um, this week I was having a conversation with a friend um, who was managing some investment properties. And with this current environment, um, you know that the commercial properties are impacted. People, um, people don't see a need for office space. People are saying, okay, let's, we can um, do this work from home. Smaller companies, they're saying, okay, we don't need office. We'll just work from home. Um, so we, we were discussing some ideas uh, that how we can transform the business, what are the new trends? Um, and, and this whole idea about business reinvention, because that industry uh, is, is thinking um, very, very strongly at this time that how to um, reinvent, reimagine this, um, this, this market where the um, the prime locations for these offices, uh, for example, downtown London, if, if you have this financial district, nobody's going to the financial district these days, everybody's working from home. So there's, there's millions and billions worth of properties that are not being utilized. So there's a thought going on that what can we do so the, maybe th this de bono thinking process um, is an idea that can be applied. Edward de bono, yes, yes six, yeah. yeah. So this can be applied, and and this whole idea of maybe to think outside of the box and inside of the box is is I think is very relevant at this time, so that people can find solutions of these problems. Because the solutions, I, I believe, they're not going to come from the traditional thinking. The yes. traditional thinking is that if we're, we are thinking in a traditional way that how are we going to solve this problem, all this, all this commercial real estate, how are we going to repurpose this commercial real estate? I think we, don't, we will not find answers in the traditional uh, thinking. We, we will... We need to um, put out, put on our maybe a blue hat or a white hat or a red hat, or all these different hats, and maybe through a collective brainstorming, understand that okay, what can be the ideas that we can apply? Mm -hmm. And and the other the other key thing which is important in this whole thinking process is, okay, one is the thinking process. Okay, we come up with some solutions. But the other one is the application of that, uh, those solutions. And that whole process of applying them is also changing. We are, we, are, we are moving away from a long cycle experiments or prototypes to a short cycle, very short cycle, agile cycle um, prototypes or these learning cycles where we apply this learning on a smaller scale, get something out of that, and then maybe build upon that. And that's the other thing, the speed is, is very important in this market, which is um, which we all need to think about as well. For sure, for sure. Um, I mean, I'm thinking that basically some people who are working from home prior to the pandemic, uh, you know, home working, flexible working, this and that. But the, the norm, the predominant modus operandi was going to an office, uh, set times, nine to five, et cetera, and then working from there. The thing that's being challenged in a way and also changed uh, because of the, we, we have been forced into it because of the pandemic. It might have happened over a number of years or decades eventually, but now it has been automatically and enforceably done immediately. 
is that you can work from home. And what happens is that when I'm in meetings, for example, uh, sometimes the other person says, I am very sorry, I am working from home. Please excuse the dogs barking in the background or the kids running around, et cetera. And that is okay. That is acceptable now because of pandemic, everybody knows you are restricted to home. So a little bit of kids crying in the background, things happening, et cetera, et cetera is okay. Now that's a big thing because previously going to office, you would have thought that, right, this is because I must appear professional in my meetings. It must be quiet. There shouldn't be dogs barking, kids running, et cetera, husband or wife shouting from the kitchen, dinner is ready, come or whatever. But now that the society's norms have changed and not just in one city or region or country, globally, if you are talking to somebody in Mexico or America or Germany or United Kingdom, anywhere and everywhere, this is the same situation. Then that means that as we start to feel more and more at ease from operating from homes for most of the traditional jobs that we used to go to the office for. The other thing in the office was that, you know, you can be present there and supervisors can see how, uh, you know, your check-in or clock in time and clock mm -hmm. out. That's not a, a thing anymore because that used to be the industrial age thing. Nowadays, people are knowledge workers and they are, they like to have this more, the, more of this uh, job enrichment and flexibility and autonomy. And it is more of a impact driven and task and goal driven engagement. You give me a task, then it's up to me if I want to do it at 3 a.m. in the morning. Why do you care if, if you get a high quality task back that you want it to get done? So the, the concept of busy bodies, people on their desk between the 9 to 5 or 8 to 6 p.m. Uh, period, if that's not there, if communication like what we are doing is rich communication, it is more efficient. So I don't have to be stuck on the highway or freeway or motorway or, or uh, in busy traffic um, areas in congested cities, worrying about parking and the parking meters and, and the expense of that. I can comfortably work from home more and, and more efficiently and without constraints of geographic boundaries I mean, you are across the pond, so to speak. I'm here in UK, you are in United States of America, but we are effectively able to communicate and coordinate. Then why and under what circumstances would people need to come to commercial real estate? What kind of tasks would mandate? And those would be new things, new tasks, because the traditional tasks are now being shifted to home working and quite effectively so. And once... Uh, how they say, once the lion gets the taste of blood, <laughs> once people know this is what we can do, they're going to say, why do I have to be there if I am able to deliver it? I was doing it for seven, eight months. You never had a problem with that. Now that suddenly the pandemic is over yeah. or the government says you can go, but I don't want to go. I have kids here. I want to spend time with them. I guarantee you, you will get the things that you need from me, the article, the logo design, the program, the software, whatever. In the knowledge industry, the knowledge can, because it's bits and bytes, it's electrical signals, they can travel much more easily than the atoms and molecules, the physical things. So I would imagine that almost all, well, I would say most of them, if not almost all of them, uh, knowledge work related activities are going to be location independent. And that was, there were signs. I mean, you have multinationals, people are working from Malaysia and London and Kuala Lumpur and, and Houston or wherever else. And they are coordinating their meetings uh, remotely. But now it would so six, six, So six months from Hawaii and six months maybe in, in downtown London. That's, that's what uh, I'm yeah. doing. Starting yeah, exactly. next Why year. Not? <laughs> next year exactly. six months on the beach and then <laughs> six months in the, the center of the city or florence or some of the, the cities that i i love so this is where organizations would start to need to think differently that what are the specific circumstances under what situations and circumstances and circumstances and conditions do people need to be in the same location and place 
I mean, creative thinking might be one of those, but there could be some more compelling reasons. And if they don't or can't find those kind of reasons, people are going to work more effectively in a distributed mechanism, then there is a real and enduring problem for the real estate owners or organizations. Why would somebody, the, the benefit has to overweigh the inconvenience and, and hurdles. If I go into what we call the city center, you call the downtown London, and it's all congested and big cities usually are, if I have to fight the traffic jams and the parking spaces and this and that, and then that's just too much of a inconvenience and hurdle. There is right. not that much of a benefit to, to achieve. So I think as we go forward, we would need to find um, aspects that allow, that make sense for majority of the people to come together for utilization of that space. If there isn't a use case for it or, or a new use case for it, then I fear, I suspect that the difficulties and the woes of real estate owners are probably going to continue. Mm. Okay. No, I think we can maybe in one of the sessions, we can go deeper in this topic more. Um, but anyway, I think we are out of, almost out of time. And um, this today was a great discussion about the whole process of thinking and, and thinking creatively. Um, so session number, uh, this was session number seven. Um, and then we're going to do one more session on creative thinking. Um, which will be two two weeks from now. Um, so I'm really excited about bringing this information and engaging in this type of dialogue with you, Mubashir. Um, let's continue the dialogue and um, we'll let's stay in touch. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Yes,